All right, well, thank you all for joining us, but most importantly, thank you very much to our honored guest, uh, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. It is an honor to uh, have you here with us today, and uh, we will get right into the program here in just a minute. But for those of you that do not know me, my name is Tom Leonard, um, the past speaker of the Michigan House of Representatives. I joined Plunkett Cooney about a year ago, and we started our government relations, public policy, and regulatory practice group. And just uh, recently, a couple months ago, we were honored to bring on Chris Young, who is the immediate past uh, chief of staff for the House Democratic uh, Caucus uh, last term. So we've got a great group here. We've got a great team. And it is an honor to, uh, you know, to have the lieutenant governor here with us today. So before I kick it off to Chris to introduce the uh, lieutenant governor, I do want to say we are going to be using the chat function today. So if you do have a question for the LG, we are going to try our best to, uh, to get to, to that towards the end of the program. So with that, we're going to get right into it because I know the Lieutenant Governor has a hard stop at 1230. So with that, uh, Chris, you want to take it away? Thank you, Tom. And thank you, uh, LG, for joining us this morning. Uh, very honored to have you joining us uh, and the Plunkett Cooney team. Uh, it was a head of behind the scenes look last session at your leadership and partnership with uh, Governor Whitmer, and uh, it was a, you're a selfless leader and uh, someone that, despite a young family, uh, is completely dedicated to the health and welfare of Michigan. Um, it was honored to be in the trenches with you last session, and uh, welcome today. And I uh, hope you could just tell us a little bit first about your story. Who are you? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Tom, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. It's really great to be here with you and to uh, be introduced to some, reconnected with others, and, and hopefully this can be the start of a connection and, and a relationship that we can do good work for people all across the state of Michigan going forward. Um, you know, my story, I'm, I'm, for those who don't know, I, I was born in Detroit. I'm from Detroit. I live in Detroit. I spent the second half of my childhood in Farmington. Um, I'm a double engineering alum of the University of Michigan College of Engineering and Computer Engineering and Computer Science. Um, and that was really uh, sparked by my grandma Doris, who was a social studies teacher at Munger Middle School in Detroit, who bought me a computer at five, making me the only kid on my block on the east side of Detroit to have a computer. And um, my parents then made the choice to let me control it, which, you know, might have been a risk at the time, but I think it ended up working out because I really fell in love with technology and, and at a young age, I, I determined that I could control technology, that it didn't need to control me. And so uh, after, after Michigan, um, I wanted to be a software developer. That's what I went to school for and I actually left the state to go be a software developer at Microsoft for four years, uh, building the SharePoint business to the fastest growing business in the history of Microsoft. Uh, and when I was out there, uh, I started a political blog on the side in my spare time. I started two uh, uh, businesses. I started a job and internship website called Detroit Intern way back in 2000, in December of 2005, which was, you know, uh, that, that web development work was, was a little, you know, it was antiquated, but nevertheless, I was connecting people with internships and opportunity in my home city. Um, I was in Seattle for four years. I, I worked on the Obama campaign in 2008 um, as a volunteer. I ran social media for Washington State, and I was very inspired by that work. I was inspired by relationships that I built um, through my political website, which back in 2005, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me, who were my age, who were speaking publicly about public affairs and politics and current events on the internet. Blogging was nowhere near the thing that it is today. So I built some relationships that ultimately led to me quitting my good job at Microsoft the week before I married my wife, who's from Southfield. She still married me. And then a month later, we moved to Washington, DC, and I actually got involved in working in uh, progressive politics as a community organizer. But as a community organizer working on social, economic, and racial justice campaigns that were made stronger because of an understanding of technology and how people communicate. So I was at the forefront of, of, of helping people use text messages for advocacy. I helped to create the Obama uh, campaign's text message list for the first presidential uh, campaign to ever use that kind of feature. Um, I worked on issues of everything from immigration reform to fair housing policy to expanding Medicaid under the ACA, uh, particularly focusing on states that had Republican governors like Michigan did at the time. And so I did that advocacy in DC for five years, um, working at place at uh, the Center for Community Change and MoveOn.org. 
And I came home with my family in 2014, home to the city of Detroit where I live now. And I actually got out of politics completely when I came home. I, I, I needed like a like a palate cleanse. And so I, um, I began working in city government because when I came home, I recognized that I had learned a tremendous amount, but I wanted to be useful to the place that made me who I am. And I felt like the place that I could have the most impact, the place, the entity, the organization that touched the most people, that touched everybody was the government. And I'd never considered working in the public sector before, even though my father's retired from the Department of Defense, but I'd never thought about working in the public sector. But I went to work for the city of Detroit in, 20, in August 2014 as a complete technocrat. Again, I wasn't involved in any politics. I was the number two in the technology department. And I was doing some of the most mundane system level work you can think of. I was helping the fire department and the water department uh, change the way they fix fire hydrants. Um, I wrote a city policy on open data and transparency. Um, I, I wrote an app or, or launched an app about how to report non-emergency service requests like broken traffic lights or street lights or um, report potholes or um, if you saw stray animals. Um, this was the work I was doing in city government and I was happy. I was so happy. My, my, I had my twin babies at home. We were raising them in Detroit. Uh, I, I was so happy. Um, and then after the election in 2016, when there were significant um, election administration challenges in the city of Detroit, I was encouraged to run for Detroit city clerk. I never considered running for public office before. Um, it was gonna be a tall mountain to climb running as three-term incumbent. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I was able to convince myself and my wife that it was, that we had a path to victory. And so I launched a really long shot campaign for Detroit City Clerk as a literal political unknown um, where I, was, I wasn't involved politically. Like I hadn't been to, you know, Democratic party meetings or anything like that since I'd been home. So I didn't know anybody. But um, I did know how to campaign because I used to work in politics though. So uh, God's grace, good luck, great team, great people, great volunteers um, led me to, to run a surprising race for, for that office, that little known office um, where I ended up losing the general election by 1,486 votes out of 100,000 votes cast in 2017. And uh, many good things came from that race, including many relationships um, with people across the community, across Southeast Michigan, and some people out state as well. But the, by far the one that bore the most fruit was a woman I met during the Labor Day parade in 2017, and that was now Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And so after that parade, we connected and we just sort of began um, communicating, you know, sparsely. And that ramped up really after my race ended. We talked a little bit more in depth. Um, I didn't even know that at the time she was thinking of asking me to be her running mate. But um, later on in 2018, she asked me to go through the process and I joined the ticket in August of 2018, uh, did the 10 week sprint on the campaign trail and now here we are. And um, so this is my first public office. Um, I, I, I am, have been really charged with a few things um, um, as a portfolio, if you will, in addition to my constitutional responsibility as president of the Michigan Senate. Um, I have been our, our our administration's lead on criminal justice reform issues and reforming our criminal legal system to make it work better and deliver more justice for more people in a way that um, protects the integrity of the system and how it can protect survivors and victims, as well as delivering uh, full access to civic life for people who repay their debts to society. Michigan has been a leader in bipartisan criminal legal system reform in the country, and I'm proud of that work. Everything from um, the, the task force on jail and pretrial incarceration, which I chaired with the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court, that has delivered, um, you know, nationally recognized reforms in our um, system when it comes to things like sentencing guidelines. Um, you know, treating traffic offenses as tra traffic offenses and non-traffic offenses not as traffic offenses. Um, changing our parole and probation system um, to be more humane and things like that. Um, I also uh, worked really hard on our, uh, our nationally recognized and really national leadership when it comes to criminal record expungement. We have the most expansive uh, record expungement program in the country. We're the only state that will actually expunge certain felony records and we're implementing an automated system to do that so that you don't have to have a barrier of a lawyer or, or all this money to be able to get your record clear so you can have full access to civic life and the economy and housing and education, but that instead um, those offenses, once you've repaid your debt and you are continuing to, to, to be a, um, a positive contributor to society, that those will fall away from your record and those barriers will therefore come down. So we've been a leader on that. Um, I also have been very um, focused on 
in the last year during the pandemic, how we can connect more people to the internet. And we'll be driving that even further this year um, as I recognize, and I think so many people now recognize the primacy of internet connectivity to the experience of civic life going forward, whether it's access to education, health services, but more importantly, and perhaps underappreciated, entrepreneurial economic opportunity. People with ideas and internet connection can change the world. And I want that to be possible for every person in every corner of every community across the state of Michigan. And last but not least during the pandemic, I have been leading uh, the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities, which has been um, focused on really centering the experience of the people who were most deeply impacted by COVID-19 from a, from a um, case rate and death rate. Um, in the state of Michigan, Black folks, for example, represent less than 14% of the population. In the first two months of the pandemic, we represented more than 41% of the people who died. And that task force got to work very quickly um, and put interventions in the street that saved lives. We distributed free masks. We uh, invested federal resources in community organizations. Um, we have uh, raised the pro for profile of implicit bias training for medical professionals and lots of other things that are included in our internal report that we released at the end of last year about our impact. But the most important is the number that the mortality rate in COVID-19 when it comes to uh, Michiganders of color is now below 10%. For, for black Michiganders, it's below 6%. And that's because the state of Michigan chose to focus on it in a way that no other state did. And that, that leadership has been recognized by the Biden-Harris administration that has modeled its own COVID equity task force after the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. So we're proud of that leadership and know we have more work to do. I certainly don't want more people to get sick and get hospitalized and die from COVID-19. I've already said goodbye to 27 people in my life. I don't wanna make that number 28. I don't want anybody else to have, have to have that experience here in our state. So that's why I'm part of why I'm chairing the Protect Michigan Commission so that we can make sure people have the information and the resources they need to make the choice to get vaccinated because that will be our pathway. Vaccination and continued testing will help us be able to engage in the activities that we miss and emerge from this pandemic together healthier and stronger. So. Uh, Chris, I hope that that covers it relatively succinctly, but I'm eager to, to hear from hear from folks on this call and, and get in the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. And Tom, if you want to get started there with the first question. Yeah, absolutely. And Lieutenant Governor, again, thank you very much. Thank you for your service to the state. Now, this first question was designed to be an easy one, but as I'm listening to everything that you have done over the past year or so, or a couple of years, this may wind up being the most difficult. But the question is this, tell us what a day in the life is like for the lieutenant governor? What is a typical day like for you? Okay, okay, I, I can work with that. So um, I have three children. Um, my, my wife and I have three children. I have, I have twin seven-year-olds who actually, who, with whom I share a birthday. Their half birthday was yesterday. They're seven and a half in one day now. And um, we have a 22-month-old daughter named Ruby um, who uh, is great. My day typically starts somewhere between five, 30 and six, or between five and six, I should say, uh, when Ruby wakes up. That's typically how my day starts, uh, trying to get her to go back to sleep for another hour or another 45 minutes um, or something so we can get that last bit out of there. Um, then um, uh, my wife and I, you know, wake up, I try to, uh, I'm, I'm typically trying to help get the kids breakfast and get ready for remote learning. My kids are currently, our kids are in Detroit public schools, they're doing virtual learning. So I'm trying to get them breakfast and get them logged on to their devices. Or my wife is trying to do some uninterrupted work before, if it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, I need to leave to come to Lansing. I'm in the car by 8.15 on my way to Lansing for that hour and 15 minute drive. Um, where I'm on the phone, typically the entire drive, whether it's getting an update on the COVID-19 pandemic status in the state or checking in with our other senior staff, governor, et cetera. I preside over Michigan Senate session um, um, almost every day, every session day. My attendance rate is pretty high because uh, I think that's a really important job. And so I'm there in Senate session, um, you know, working to make sure that the body um, functions properly and is respectful and that, um, can, that we can actually try to get the work done uh, with the people of the state of Michigan. But then when I leave that chamber, um, we could be anywhere. So sort of pre-pandemic, um, I had a pretty aggressive schedule on the road. Um, we'll be going to communities across the state of Michigan. Um, my wife would joke that, uh, you know, her coworkers kind of asked her, oh, what's Garland doing? And she's like, I don't know where he is as long as he's home by 5.30, I don't really care. And so I could be somewhere, uh, you know, in Alpena or Cadillac or Berrien County or Monroe County 
or um, I could be in Lansing, I could be in Port Huron, it could be really anywhere. I'm just trying to meet people where they are because I do think public service is about listening to people and understanding what's important to them and then, and then trying to find a way for me to deliver um, the changes or the solutions that they're uh, wanting to see in their communities or in some cases, you know, get out of the way so they can do their thing. So um, that's what I was doing. During the pandemic, it's been um, a lot of that same try to attempt to do that kind of community connection, but it's been done virtually like this meeting is today. Um, which is in some ways allowed me to be able to have more opportunity to reach more people for whom it may have been more difficult uh, to be able to reach physically. Um, and then uh, again, a lot of updates on what's happening with the pandemic response, what we can be doing, um, helping to make sure that our stakeholders are involved, uh, you know, driving the, the racial disparities task force with our staff and the, the involvement of every state department and agency. So I'm doing that uh, regularly. I do try to, um, I, I am um, home for dinner um, most days, uh, which is again, a little bit easier because of the pandemic as well. So the, the events may be virtual. Um, on Sundays, I may do virtual church services on Tuesdays and Wednesdays or Wednesdays. I'm typically calling into a Bible study or something like that, um, to connect with people, um, community, community groups, chamber, chamber of commerce meetings during the day, things like that. So, um, I try to make sure, I think my job is to have high quality conversations every day with people in Michigan. And so um, I, try to, I try to find opportunities to do that as flexibly as possible. And then um, it's my job to, I typically put the baby to sleep. Um, so then I, I'm doing that. And then I'm trying to make sure I can finish washing dishes before I fall asleep on the couch sometime around midnight. That's the day. <laughs> Quite a day. I'm sure no two are the same either. Um, LG, one of the questions that came in was regarding the accelerating private and public sector investments in alternative and sustainable energy. Uh, what are you aware of that's happening at the state level to help businesses prepare for what appears to be a new green economy that could arrive sooner than later? I'm very excited about this, Chris. I think it's a tremendous um, growth opportunity for our state, an entrepreneurship opportunity for our state. We have so many people with ideas in Michigan and um, I think that the sector, sort of whatever uh, energy related sector, um, electrification of vehicles, automation of infrastructure, smart infrastructure, connected infrastructure, industry 4.0, I think these are tremendous opportunities um, for Michigan uniquely because of our heritage, history, and present reality with the depth of engineering talent that we have in the state of Michigan. Um, we are the best place to, to locate an engineering company in the country. And I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunity for those kinds of companies in that sector, whether it's in, you know, again, green energy space, in the uh, aerospace, defense space. Like, I think Michigan is really a good home for these. And so um, certainly um, I, I care very deeply about this as, as a recovering entrepreneur. Um, I want to um, make sure that people with ideas have the resources and supports they need to be successful. The state can be a good partner um, to them and make sure that people know that this is the place where they should be. Um, to make their idea real. And I think we are going to see a significant investment in this space from the Biden-Harris administration. And so we need to do everything we can to position the state of Michigan to be able to receive those federal resources and leverage those to create opportunities in the private sector. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, is some, uh, it's an important part of our efforts on skills training and closing the skills gap, programs like the Michigan Reconnect program and the Futures for Frontliners program and the Going Pro program. Those are about creating pathways, tuition-free pathways to training and certification for people. And there's gonna be a whole lot more demand for people with that the expertise in these green areas of our economy. Um, I'm actually really eager to see, again, how Michiganders take advantage of those training opportunities to be able to build those businesses of today and tomorrow here in our state. All right, Lieutenant Governor, as we go into the next question, I want to put a plug in for somebody I see right now, and you'll see where this is going, where this is leading. But uh, I do see Laurel McGifford on here uh, right now, who is our, our uh, firm director of diversity and inclusion. And I don't know about the rest of the firms, but I think we're one of the few that actually has a director that's focused on diversity and inclusion. And Laurel does an incredible job. And I know shortly after the George Floyd tragedy last summer, uh, she had Chief Craig on uh, to address the firm, and it was very powerful. And then a few weeks ago, she had Rochelle Riley, as you know, former uh, free press writer. So this question was passed along from one of the partners. And the question is this, a series of tragedies last summer created another opportunity for real dialogue about inequities in this country. 
You stood tall right away leading the conversation on police accountability in Michigan. Can you recap those efforts and share what additional steps in Michigan are currently underway? Yeah, thank you for that. This is, this is really important. I think that um, we are still in the midst of a generational call for racial justice, equity, and community investment. Um, we, we are, and I don't think that's gone away. And I think every generation um, has a call or a watershed or a flashpoint moment. And that happened to come last year during the midst of the pandemic with the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and Ahmaud Arbery and, and others. And these murders still happen. Like they didn't end with those particular murders. And, and I think people are, the, the, the murder of George Floyd is, is front of mind for people as Derek Chauvin's trial has now commenced um, in, in Minnesota. And so, um, you know, this is just really front of mind um, for folks. So, you know, it is clear that there are, there need to be improvements in how policing is carried out, period. And that is true in Michigan, just like it's true in a lot of places. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of is the fact that, you know, um, the governor and I um, had conversations with um, law enforcement leaders, with police unions um, last year about what that improvement uh, can and should look like. Um, and I think in Michigan, we may, dare I say, we might be in a, in, a, in a slightly different place in some other states as far as those entities being more open to talking about improvement and opportunities for improvement. We happen to have you know, pretty progressive law enforcement leadership, whether it's um, folks like, you know, I'll, I'll mention Sheriff Jerry Clayton out of Washtenaw County, who was part of our uh, 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 jail and pretrial incarceration task force, who I had many conversations about these issues, but also even law enforcement professionals who are in the Michigan legislature, like Republican Representative Mike Mueller. So I think there's work to be done here. And so what we called for last year uh, were, were a few things. One was um, just trying to implement some best practices in Michigan, seeing things like the fact that civilian oversight has been shown to really have an impact on the relationship between law enforcement professionals and the communities that they serve. And the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards did not have civilian oversight. And so we actually added or expanded the board of MCOLs, as it's called, to include civilian oversight and also include participation from the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. And so that was one important step. And we hope that that's, we did that in part because it's the right thing to do at the state level, but also because we hope that it sends a signal and is a model for communities to look at how they can integrate civilian oversight into their law enforcement practices and processes. Um, so that's one piece. And the second thing we did is we did call for some changes in, 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 in how police officers or, or law enforcement professionals really broadly um, are trained. We called for implicit bias training. We saw an implicit bias training piece of legislation actually passed unanimously in the Michigan House uh, but it withered on the vine in the Michigan, in Michigan Senate, excuse me, but it withered on the vine in the Michigan House. That's legislation we still would like to see come forward because, you know, if anything has become clear in the last year, it's that bias has consequences. Bias when it comes to policing can have deadly consequences. Bias when it comes to medical professionals can have deadly consequences in, in any sort of global health challenge, for example. And so uh, we certainly want to see that come forward. We also called for different practices, whether it came to things like uh, carotid holds and, um, uh, duty to intervene policies that we call for these things to come into play in Michigan and that needs to go through the Michigan legislature and there were proposals on the table to do that last session that did not um, go anywhere I'd love to see those reintroduced and that there to, and then that we do the bipartisan work to be able to bring those to reality so that all Michiganders um, whether you are a law enforcement professional or someone engaged with a law enforcement professional you can do or you can experience the thing that I've seen on a placard or a poster in every single law enforcement building that I've ever been in. There's a poster on a wall somewhere over a door that says, everybody goes home. Whenever there is any kind of interaction or engagement, we want everybody to go home and everybody to go home whole. I want that for the law enforcement professionals and the people they're engaged with in the community. And so we need to get to a place where that is possible. <clears throat> and we, need, we may need to change the way that we, um, carry out the practices of law enforcement and the way that we um, invest in our communities to make that more possible. We may need to um, give law enforcement professionals more and different tools. We may need to augment law enforcement with other sorts of service providers that, so that we can actually get people, you know, the care and services they need, which, when, which may not be best delivered by a law enforcement professional. Um, and so we, we're, we want to have an open mind on this in Michigan. Um, I was hoping for more progress to have happened last legislative session, frankly. And, and I think there's an opportunity for that still to be picked up on the table. I know the Speaker of the House has a law enforcement background this session, and so I'd hope that this is something he's willing to take up. 
thanks, Lieutenant Governor. And building on that, one of the questions that just came into the chat, you know, how can we go from talking about diversity and inclusion to taking action, and especially as a law firm? So, you know, every person, every organization has a role to play in, in creating more equitable access to opportunity and outcomes. And the first thing you need to do is look, in, look internally. You know, how, how are, one, how are people experiencing your work and your workplace? You know, are, are people able to be their full and best selves? Um, if, if they are threatened in some way, is there a mechanism for that to be addressed that is fair, that is real, and that is consequential if it needs to be? Um, and then in terms of what your, your sort of outward facing experiences, you know, looking at the practices. So in, 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 in the coronavirus response, you know, the, the task force recommended the use of a tool in state government called the equity impact assessment tool. And what this really is, is it's a, it's a, it's a decision making framework um, that says that whenever you're evaluating a, a policy, uh, a program, a practice, that you can think about how it impacts different communities in different ways. And that thinking may lead to design changes in how you go about that policy program or practice that could lead to, again, more equitable or more desired positive outcomes, potentially, for more people. And so applying that same type of thinking to the way that you go about um, you know, the client work you pursue, about your relationship with the communities where, where your business is located and where your, where your um, team members live, and then about how you espouse the values in terms of how you describe the work that you do. Like, are you, is, is ensuring access to opportunity for a broad array of Michiganders part of your mission? I mean, it probably should be, because I think we all want that. I think the clients that you serve, um, uh, you want them to be a broad uh, uh, sampling of people across whatever industries you focus on, and you want uh, those folks to have uh, access, opportunity, and prosperity. That requires intentional investment in making sure that your team members are able to deliver that and have the skills and are equipped to do that. So you need to invest in your people and their training and their know-how to be able to make that a reality. That's where I'd start. You know, I, I am, I don't really care about the like public pronouncement platitudes of like being, saying you're an anti-racist organization or whatever. Like I, I, I literally don't care about that. Like what I care about is, um, is there an ability to be self-reflective and then to say, okay, if we have an honest self-assessment, then do we have the mechanisms and the will to be able to make changes for the better? We've had to do that in state government. You know, we declared racism and public health crisis to try to unlock the potential for state agencies and departments to be able to actually think about the impacts on different racial and ethnic groups in the state of Michigan that policies have. Like that wasn't happening in a meaningful or robust way. And so we made that executive directive as part of our um, response to COVID-19 um, to be able to give people the space and tools to do that. And so um, that, that's, one, that's something I would think about. Well, thank you, sir. And man, I've got about five or six other questions. We got to get you back on here, but I do not want to get in trouble with Shaquilla. She told us 1230. So <laughs> before, before we close, is there anything that you want um, that, that you want our crowd to know? Anything you want to say in closing, sir? Um, I, I just, I, I want you to know that um, I think that this year, 2021, this year of emergence um, is a year where we really need to think about how can we double down on access to opportunity in Michigan? How can we make it true that a person with an idea, that they will see Michigan as the best place to have that idea? and to potentially make that idea real. How can the state of Michigan, for example, can we lead the nation in new business starts? Because I think that there are a lot of people who've been home a little more than normal, who have been thinking of ideas, like a lot of ideas. And some of those ideas are probably really good. And so we need to try to you know, make the soil fertile enough so that those people will want to plant those seeds here in the state of Michigan. And so I guess my challenge to you would be, what are, what are you doing to make that possible? And that starts with 
are you making sure that you're promoting the, the tools that we have in the toolbox to end this pandemic, testing, vaccination, mask wearing, being careful. And then all the connections that you have to the resources that you're aware of, what are you doing to make sure those resources are available to more people in a more substantial way? Um, I think doing those two things will really help uh, set our trajectory in the state of Michigan to emerge from this stronger in the name of and in tribute to those to whom we've had to say goodbye. Well, sir, thank you again for being here. Uh, we appreciate it very much. I know that your time is very valuable. Thank you for everything that you do for our state and uh, look forward to watching you uh, in, the, in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much. And to all of our viewers, um, today's session was recorded. It will be uploaded to the website very soon. So if you wanna pass it along or you wanna watch it again, feel free to do so. So with that, we'd like to thank you on behalf of Plunkett Cooney and the Government Relations Practice. Thank you for being here today and hopefully we'll see you again soon.